Thank you guys so much for being patient. We have such good like visual stuff to share with people because visual things like videos and, and, and images are a big part of using pop culture in the first place. So thank you for waiting. Um, we are here for the uh, Pop Culture Warriors panel. We're gonna learn about how different communities are organizing online to save the world, raise money for good causes, and really get people involved in the communities uh, through their fandoms. Um, real quick, my name is Ilana Levin. I'm the Director of Communications for the Writers Guild of America East. We're the union that represents screenwriters, TV writers, news writers, people who write web series and digital media, um, and we are really interested in promoting uh, the ways that our members and other creative artists can help uh, raise awareness and get people involved in issues because pop culture is really how a lot of people experience the world around them. Um, I, I have a confession to make though, which is uh, in 1995, which is the first time I ever got on the internet, the very first thing that I looked up was a British record label that put on like ska music from the 1980s. And I really wanted to get more information about the bands that they had. And this was the first time that I ever was on the internet. And I could have looked up something about activism because I was an activist at that point in time in my life and continue to be. I could have looked up something regarding my schoolwork, which was allegedly pretty important. But I looked up something about music. And that's what most people do. Most people, while people use the internet for their work, People also are in their lives incredibly connected to popular culture, whether it's movies, whether it's music. Um, that's where people are in their lives. And one of the ways that we can try to make sure that the sort of activist and social participation that we want to see coming out of, out of society uh, happens is by reaching people where they are. Um, our panelists are people who are experts at that question, actually. The uh, panelists, be, or we're going to have um, Andrew Slack, who runs the Harry Potter Alliance, Chrissy Spivak from Spivy, Spivy sorry, <laughs> from <laughs> from Breakthrough TV. Uh, then we're um, having Eric Martin from Reddit, and then we have Eddie Geller from Reddit, from a pack that came out of Reddit, the OSDF. So. Um, well, thank you. You know, I, how many people here are involved in activist organizations or nonprofit organizations? And how many people are trying to get volunteers or fundraise? I, yes, many people. One of the things that I notice doing campaigns is that if I'm doing a rally to fight against luxury developers, and I have Bob and Sally will come because they're activists. And then when I'm doing a campaign to, like, to raise money for a candidate that we want to support, Bob and Sally will also come. And one of our challenges is how to get people other than the hardcore loyalists, Bob and Sally, who come to everything, to come and support our causes. Because Bob and Sally have day jobs. And Bob and Sally don't make a ton of money. So if we want to raise more money and get more people to be active in our causes, then we need to be able to broaden the world of people who are involved in activism, which is what we're here to do today. Andrew Slack is the founder of um, the Harry Potter Alliance, which is a perfect example of a group that has used people's love and adoration for a series of books and now movies to organize together to save the world and do amazing activism, raising tons of money for Haitian relief efforts, for example, uh, getting a lot of petitions in and getting people educated, as well as signing petitions on net neutrality and more. So I will take it away, Andrew. Thank you. Do you want, should maybe people come up, like can folks over there see or? No, so why don't you come up and, oh, oh yeah. no, but then you can't run your Mac. I take no, it No, it's cool. The, he can, he, thank you. you. Okay, great, thanks guys. this way. Yes. Okay. I was going to be looking at my outline, cheating, but now I can't do that as well. It's like this sloppy piece of paper. Uh, I just, I didn't realize this. Hi. Right. Welcome to the Harry Potter Alliance. And the HPA wants you for money. Um, just fundraising, that's what I have to do. Um, so my name's Andrew Slack. It is an honor to be here. This is the second time I've presented at uh, uh, one of the National Media, National Conference for Media Reform conferences. That was redundant. 
Um, let me start off. How many people here have read all the Harry Potter books? How many people here have read part, some of the Harry Potter books? How, how, how many people have heard of Harry Potter? I can't, there are people that didn't raise their hands. So either, well, anyway. Um, we just have to liven those people up a little bit to get them participating. Um, so it doesn't matter if you haven't read Harry Potter for the purposes of this presentation. Uh, <laughs> the Harry Potter Alliance, in short, is uh, we use parallels from Harry Potter to educate and inspire hundreds of thousands of Harry Potter fans to act as heroes in our world. Uh, we do that through the use of social media and tapping into the larger Harry Potter fan community. Now, there are a lot of parallels in Harry Potter uh, that J.K. Rowling put in explicitly, implicitly, or unintentionally. Uh, she used to work for Am Amnesty International. Um, but before we go to those parallels and, and, and drawing on them, there's a phrase I like to use, uh, ETR, energy, talent, resources. Most people have pretty good sense of values in our world, um, like they think genocide is bad um, or climate crisis is bad if they acknowledge the climate crisis. And if they don't, they still think pollution is, is bad. But they don't, we don't generally marry our um, values to our ETR, to our energy, talent, and resources. We generally put our ETR in our private lives, which is great, it's fine. And, and in our public lives, our interaction is sort of cursory, and it's normally through t television and books and movies and, and that sort of thing. So people in our culture are putting energy into things like Harry Potter, talent into things like Harry Potter. Uh, and when I say that, if you go to the fan websites of the Harry Potter fandom, there are wizard rock bands, starting with Harry and the Potters, who started the organization with me. They're an indie rock punk band who looks at Harry Potter as a DIY punk rock kid fighting Voldemort, who is the man. And they sing songs like Voldemort Can't Stop the Rock. Their, their fandom is gigantic. That inspired an enemy band called Draco and the Malfoys, who sing songs like, My Dad is Rich, Your Dad is Dead. <laughs> there are hundreds of these bands that have been formed. And starting with Harry and the Potters, who are on our board, uh, they repost our messages. And we go out to an international audience immediately. When that happened, we began courting the Harry Potter fan uh, websites, and they started putting our podcasts on their feeds. One of them got downloaded over 120,000 times. It was on Darfur. And um, it was like, screw e CBS Evening News for not reporting on Darfur. We're reaching Harry Potter fans using the language of fantasy, which is that in Harry Potter, something horrible happens, and the government and the consolidated media aren't paying attention to it. And it's up to Harry and his friends to start a student activist group that they, they name after their mentor, Dumbledore, called Dumbledore's Army. And our approach is that we are a Dumbledore's army, and just as Dumbledore's army woke the world up, despite this consolidated media, despite a complacent government, to this horrible thing, we are waking the world up to ending genocide, we are waking the world up to ending and confronting the climate crisis, and that has really caught on because it's a way to step into trying to be the heroes that we've always dreamt of being. We have donated over 55,000 books across the world. That number is about to double. Uh, as we build a library in, um, in Brooklyn right now, we've donated, uh, we, we raised uh, over $123,000 from small donations um, in a two-week period around Haiti, sending $123,000 to Partners in Health, and that sent five cargo planes full of medical supplies to Haiti, each of them named after a different Harry Potter character. Um, we have done a lot on LGBTQ equality. Um, for those who know Harry Potter, Hagrid has to live in the closet for being a half-giant. Uh, Lupin has to hide in the closet for his identity as a werewolf. And Harry Potter is literally forced to live inside of a closet because of his identity for the first 11 years of his life. We do a lot of anti-genocide activism and a lot of other stuff that's pretty cool and great, including media reform activism and introducing people to rocking out against Volta Media. Um, right now, we are in the middle of negotiating with the CEO of Warner Brothers. We have over 15,000 signatures that I'm about to tell them about, including the signature of Ivana Lynch, who plays Luna Lovegood in the movies, and uh, that is to make all Harry Potter chocolate fair trade. 
And fair trade chocolate is a very, very important issue for a number of reasons. Uh, one, there's child slavery involved. Two, uh, cocoa farmers are amongst the most exploited farmers on the planet. And three, and this is the one that always elicits the most gasps, uh, there was a recent study that came out that cocoa farmers are moving to other crops at such a fast rate because of the fact that they're still being given starvation wages that if it continues at this rate, in 20 years, uh, chocolate will be as rare and as expensive as caviar. Oh. Yeah. So child slavery, it's bad, but we all know it exists, but chocolate, it's our chocolate. Um, so uh, we're, we, we've gotten a lot of media coverage. Uh, we're... We're being studied by Henry Jenkins, who's a professor on fan communities uh, and a, a bit of an academic heavyweight, a MacArthur-funded um, research project at the University of Southern California. And uh, he's looking particularly at us and a group called Invisible Children, which worked on child soldiers in Uganda, when what he calls avatar activism and what I call cultural acupuncture, which is looking for where is the healthy energy in our culture, that ETR, energy, talent, and resources, and how can we communicate that energy in an authentic way to make the rest of the culture healthier? And I can go on and on about that, and there's even like a spiritual definition that I could give. Um, well, the, when, when the, maybe on a question and answer. Uh, but uh, last year we won $250,000 from Chase Bank Community Giving. We won a contest on Facebook. There's about 10,000 organizations involved in that contest on who can get the most votes. We were the number one um, Winner, it's because the internet is our turf. We have over 80 chapters. We have uh, 50 volunteer staff. When that happened, we shut down all operations and we had a staff of over 150 um, temporary volunteers. We were meeting on a live stream. Can, can you go to livestream.com slash imagine better and put it on mute? Um, live stream, for those who don't know it, we're gonna see what it looks like in a second. We have a lot of meetings on live stream. Live stream was our office. We don't have an office. So we met across the world in live stream and uh, this thing right here is like a, a video player or an audio player, depending on what you're, what you're doing. And right, uh, if you can just move this to the, to, if we can just see the rest of the screen. Thank you. Uh, well, it's not been loaded yet, but here is a chat. So people are chatting in there. So I can get in and give an inspirational speech and people are chatting and responding to it and then I'm responding to what they're saying. Was there, no, okay. <laughs> so um, how am I doing on time? So $250,000, how did we win it? We didn't just use every facet of the Harry Potter fan community. We also reached out to other fan communities and told them about our next project, Imagine Better, which is being launched on the, la the day of the last Harry Potter movie. In 2008, J.K. Rowling said, we do not need magic to change the world. We have all the power we need inside of us already. We have the power to imagine better. With media consolidation and other things happening in our world, many of the messages in our world are about imagining worse and creating a deficit of imagination. But in a world where we can feed every single person, and then some, and throw out the, a lot of the food, and yet there's the amount of starvation that there is, we don't have an economic deficit. We don't have a material deficit. We have a spiritual deficit. We have a deficit of the human imagination. And so we need our artists. We need the fans of those artists to become artists themselves in remixing that work and reappropriating that work to tap into the imagination of the human race and do more. So we got uh, tons of fan communities of other blockbuster books, TV shows, and movies to push the voting for us to win because we're going to be bringing all of them together starting um, in July for a united fan coalition. We have uh, New York Times best-selling young adult authors who are working with us. This is an unprecedented network of storytellers and lovers of story to uplift the story of the human race, of individuals and communities across the world, um, to harness the energy of popular culture for social change. One of those people is John Green. He's a young adult author, and he's, a, he's, a, he's got over a million Twitter followers, and he is an internet celebrity. He has helped us tap into the world of YouTube celebrities. So we're also uniting YouTube celebrities on this effort as well, and that's crucial. YouTube is crucial to all of this. Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and um, some sort of live webcasting is essentially what we do with social media. Um, John put out a video for us to win, but that video was about a friend of mine. She became a very good friend of mine, um, and uh, in late August, she died. Uh, her name is Esther Earl. She, is 16 years, she was 16 years old when she died. I'm gonna like you to play that video, if you could. Uh, it's called With Esther. If you could put the volume back on. Actually, shut down the live stream. Part of the proceeds of that put, put that, shut down the live stream, please. Thank you. 
And um, so let me just tell you about John real fast before you hit play. Uh, John and his, I'm going to go really fast. John and his brother Hank. John's a best-selling young adult author. Hank is a uh, uh, well-known singer-songwriter and um, eco-blogger. And they created something called the Vlog Brothers, where they vlog, to, they video blog to each other every single week. Now, these video blogs have over 100,000 views every week now. They've built up this audience. They refer to their audience as nerd fighters. Essentially, nerds, we're taking back the term. You know, we control the internet, nerds. And uh, we're not made of flesh or, or, or blood or muscle or nerves like regular people. We're made of the force called awesome, and it's only awesome that will fight the, the, the force of world suck. So that's what we're up against is world suck. World suck is the amount of suck that exists in the world. Um, the nerd fighters um, are a giant community. They're bigger than us, but we're united with them, and we sort of add the structure for them to do a lot of their campaigns. Um, John made a video, two nerd fighters. These are a bunch of nerd fighters. This one is Esther. Um, she's probably the most famous nerd fighter for her Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, wish. She wished to meet all of her best online friends um, on a road trip. She got two sick, so they all came to Boston where I live. That's where I met Esther, and John Green was her hero, and he came down and made a video about it. And we're going to show that video in a second, but I do want to emphasize something very important that hasn't been emphasized about youth and um, social media is that Esther formed incredible friendships while being bound to her house and uh, oftentimes to her bed. Um, kids who are terminally ill, kids who have special needs are doing this all the time. It's not part of this discussion. So, so to the FCC chairman, I ask that he protect net neutrality, not only for the sake of our democracy, but for the sake of terminally ill teenagers. Um, and that is the constituency that is not being recognized. So um, let's play that video. Good morning, Hank, it's Monday. On the internet, crazy crayon. Hank, you know Esther. She helps run the constantly updating spew of awesome known as F.E.A. Nerd Fighters. Blink in the doobly doo. She also has cancer, which sucks. This weekend, a bunch of her friends got to go up to Boston to visit her, and I went and visited with them for a day, and it was an amazing day of amazing. And it made me really proud to be a nerd fighter to see these relationships that began online in Nerd Fighteria be so sustaining and meaningful IRL. So what we do? Oh, we all wrote silly questions on this volleyball, and then we would throw each other the volleyball and answer the questions. Like I had to answer what color my underwear was. The question is, is, what color is your underwear? <laughs> and then underneath that it says, panties. <laughs> I guess in case you don't know what underwear is. Uh, it's black with little white palm trees. <laughs> That's so, very cute. Now we have to decide which Harry Potter character Esther would be. She's a big Harry Potter fan. More on that in a second. I don't know who I'd be. Maybe I'd be a mix of Luna and someone else. Yeah. Luna, half Luna, half Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah, that would be That's very different. Then we tried to have a puff fight, but it turned into a headbutting contest, as puff fights so often do. Yeah, I don't know. Yours yeah. has a lot more shape to it. <laughs> Down. Oh, too much, too much. That was a headbutt, yeah. Okay. <laughs> then we went on this insane adventure through the twilight streets of Boston trying to find this one place that had espresso and gelato. Then we all had espresso and felt terribly sophisticated. Anyway, all night long I was thinking about how grateful I am to know Esther and trying to figure out a way to, like, give thanks for our weird internet-based cross-generational friendship. And then I remember that the first amazing night of amazing I spent with Esther was at LeakyCon, a Harry Potter conference. And after all, if it weren't for Harry Potter, I would have no Esther, and also there probably wouldn't be a Nerdfighteria. Then I thought about the fact that Esther is a huge supporter of the Harry Potter Alliance, a charitable organization that Nerdfighteria often partners with. Like, remember when Nerdfighteria and the Harry Potter Alliance raised $123,000 to help Haiti heal and we had the SSD FTBA load up and go over to Haiti? Right, that Harry Potter Alliance. Hank, the HPA is currently in this huge contest to potentially win $250,000 to dramatically improve the amount of world suck they can decrease. The HPA is currently in third place, but what if we all go, blink in the doobly doo, and we vote, and we tell our friends to vote, and they win the $250,000, which allows them to continue their work getting books to kids around the world, from the Mississippi Delta to Rwanda, and allows them to grow the work they do advocating for human rights around the world. And also, it is a small little way of saying to Esther, hi, thank you for being awesome. I'm not going to say that we should win this contest for Esther, because if I say that, she will throw up in the back of her mouth and hate me. I think we should win this contest with Esther. So if you want to give thanks for the existence of Nerdfighteria and the existence of Esther and the existence of wonderful boy wizards, 
please go to the link in the doobly-doo and vote for the Harry Potter Alliance. So please go vote, and thanks again to everyone in Boston. It was so fun to hang out with you guys. Hank, you'll find this out at Vid. Thank you, guys. Um, I Before I end, I just want to say that in the question and answer and later in individual conversations with all of you, I would like to talk to you about what we're doing with Imagine Better and uh, with Nerdfighteria and um, with internet celebrities and young adult authors and this theory of cultural acupuncture and how it could apply to all of your work and all of our work collectively as we work for media reform and social justice and uh, community and personal empowerment across the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things that was really amazing about Harry Potter Alliance is how it just came out of the fans um, and their own activism. And I want to turn it over now to Chrissy, who works for Breakthrough, which is actually an international human rights organization that uses a lot of really creative mass communications and pop culture tools to educate people. Um, Chrissy, let's. Uh, okay. Do you need me to pro do you need me to pop something up for you yep, first? I'll or? Put it up. Great. Hello, everybody. And I promise we'll take questions afterwards, so I apologize for Bear with me, I'm gonna use a PowerPoint, but I won't be reading off the PowerPoint, so <laughs> you won't hate me. There we go. While we're waiting, I'll just remind everybody that you should all be tweeting about this on Twitter if you can, with the hashtag and That's NC. terrifying. Yeah? There we go. Okay. Where's the, oh, it's the in keynote. And I would promise to retweet anything that people write about this particular panel, Can and I, I have a lot of followers, so you should do that. For your own good. Oh, okay, same thing. Uh, I'm sorry? The hashtag for the general conference, so it's NCMR11. There okay. you go. All right. Again, hello, I'm Chrissy. I'm from Breakthrough. Uh, we're based in New York City and India. Uh, Breakthrough is a human rights organization, as Alana said. Um, then we use pop culture to teach human rights issues. Um, in the US, we do namely racial justice and immigration issues. We create video games, animations, music videos. Um, and in the US, our main form of distribution is online. Um, we are a very small organization. There's about eight of us. I know there's organizations that are much smaller, but we feel like we're teeny tiny. Um, and we work with uh, much bigger organizations that are on the ground that don't have the resources to create video games and animations and all of that. And in India, we're definitely more more on the ground in communities, um, working in women's rights and domestic violence. We're actually on television, um, we're on billboards, we're on the radio in India. So that just gives you uh, a bit about Breakthrough in a nutshell. Um, I, I wanna show you this animation that we did, hopefully, God willing, it will play, called Don't Deport Me, Scotty. Um, we basically use the characters from Star Trek to do a play on um, animation, uh, excuse me, on immigration. Um, this animation showed it at the Angelica Theaters in New York City. Are there any New York City folks in here? Yay! Um, and Lamely Theaters in California um, in 2009. The impossible has happened. We have received a subspace signal warning that outsiders from other galaxies are taking over the world. The alert says this is a major emergency. Aliens are we'll overrunning the entire Federation. They're taking jobs and destroying our security. Something has to be done to stop this menace. Captain, may I suggest? You'll do no such thing, Mr. Schlock. According to this transmission, you're an alien, which puts your status in question. Most illogical, Captain. I am a permanent resident of the Federation. Sorry, schlock, but an alien's an alien. Captain, should we put him in the teleporter? No, we'll use the teleporter. <laughs> so long, sucker. <laughs> well, that takes care of that. <laughs> Mr. Slufu, ahead. Warp factor one. Captain, the main Malacourt's Rabistat is malfunctioning. I don't understand. Can't you get it working again? I'm sorry, sir, but that was Mr. Schlock's job. Uh-oh.
Snotty. Snotty, are you there? So this uh, animation was great for us, actually. Um, it was a great way to get people that were just on YouTube looking for Star Trek, looking for other things, and running across this. Um, and also, it was a great way to, you know, you wouldn't think that you'd be able to show an animation in a major theater in New York City, but they were, you know, really willing to work with us, work with us for a nonprofit rate. We worked with an animator. We do everything pretty, pretty scrappy. We're really... Um, uh, flexible with animators that we work with and all of that to uh, tell stories in a different way and trying to access audiences that normally wouldn't acro come across um, content about immigration. Um, Breakthrough started with a music video in India. Our executive director um, is from India and she came across a story about a woman who uh, was in a, a violent relationship and she left that relationship um, to become a truck driver. And this music video is like one of our most popular music videos, um, still it's a cult classic in India. Um, and you know, it's just a great, it's kind of just, this is how we started, using music videos. And um, you know, if, if anyone's um, interested in using music videos, it's a great inroads in getting conversations started about domestic violence, because that's something that's not really um, discussed in India. It's a very taboo subject, um, so it really worked for us. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Iced. Has anyone heard of this video game in here? Um, Iced was a game we did in 2008 on immigration. It was the first video game um, of its kind. And we actually took the game as a PowerPoint to a Games for Change uh, um, excuse me, video game uh, panel, and it took off. Fox News was calling, CNN was calling, um, and it was just pretty controversial back in 2008. And I would just want to show you a video again so you can see what it looks like. If it plays. Hey, yo, grab that kid. Hey, grab the kid. Since 1996. Almost two million people have been deported from the U.S. They do not have access to due process. They have no idea of their destiny. Are these our American values? Again, icedgame.com. And this uh, game, we worked with high school students to develop uh, the maps. Um, and again, another really, really hard uh, project. Again, very scrappy working with uh, different game developers. We wrote a lot of the content in-house. Um, we use any means necessary to create it, and it got us a ton of press, even when it was a PowerPoint. Um, so it even, you know, it started out as just this small idea that just kind of blew up. Um, and this project uh, that was my baby, I Am This Land, just ended. It was a video contest. Um, and we really wanted to get young people involved in making videos. Um, but we said, you know, how can we reach folks that are not just interested in social justice issues? So we partnered with Activision. Um, actually, I met um, the head of Activision at a panel, and I told him about the idea. And he said, sure, what do you want as prizes? And they shipped us boxes of Guitar Heroes, boxes of DJ Heroes. Um, it was just a matter of asking the question. Um, you never know, you know, who's going to say yes. And we partnered with Spin Magazine, and the winner gets um, all of these pri all of these video games. They get an internship with Spin Magazine, um, and actually, um, the winners was this uh, great team from Flushing International High School in Queens, New York. Um, they did such a professional video. Um, they were honored in New York City as the Queens People of the Week. Um, so, kind of again, another small idea and another uh, situation of just you know, pitching your idea and you know, getting in front of Activision. If you tell young people, Spin Magazine, Activision, um, they're already interested in making video. They already have the skills. They already have the resources. And this was a high school team that did it as a project um, in response to bullying in their high school. And they won, so. Okay, the latest that we're really excited about is a video game we did. Um, it's, we've been working on it for two years. It just released on Facebook this week. It's called America 2049. And we're really excited about it. It's the first um, video game on Facebook of its kind. It's not like Farmville at all or Mafia <laughs> Wars. Um, it's transmedia. There's obviously social networking. It's online. It's offline. Um, I'm going to try to explain the premise. Um, bear with me. Um, you are working um, in America 2049, 
as an agent for an organization called the Council on American Heritage. Your boss is Victor Garber, who uh, worked on, obviously, from Alias. Um, he's been in um, the Titanic. Um, and you are looking for a man by the name of Ken Asaba, who is Harold Perrineau from Lost. Um, again, another situation where we pitched the idea, and they liked it, and they came on board. Um, so let me show you. Victor Garber, this is on Facebook. This is what it looks like. Um, you are yourself. It pulls in your Facebook profile. And Victor Garber is giving you your instructions. Um, let me just show you a little bit of the interface, the gameplay. Ah. Where's a little video? Hmm. It's 2049 and America is in turmoil. The nation is divided by terror, pandemic, and unrest. The government is in disarray, and the future looks even darker. But not everyone has given up hope. Welcome to the Council on American Heritage, Agent. Your job is to help us make things right. You'll use this terminal to manage a remote ground team as it moves through the country. Be sure to read your agent manual carefully. Once you're done, the boss will give you your first mission. Welcome, Agent. Want Glad to have you working with us. I'm afraid we'll be throwing you right into the deep end. We have an urgent case for you. You'll be hunting down a man by the name of Ken Osaba. Our records indicate he's from Uganda. He escaped from a quarantine center outside of Portland last night. We can't have people running loose, spreading who knows what kind of diseases around. It's not safe. So your job is to get Osaba back behind bars until we can be sure he's clean. Your assigned ground team will be in Portland and ready to go any minute now. Don't worry. We have a cross-operational agreement in place with the regional government, so you'll be free to do your job without interference from the local authorities. Now go find him. Good luck, Agent. We're counting on you. So just a little bit of the gameplay. So you're going through and you are, oh, sorry. You're going through and you are answering questions, you're solving puzzles, you're cracking codes. It's pretty complex. There's uh, 12 weeks of gameplay, and each week has a different human rights theme. So last this week when we launched, um, it was racial justice and immigration. Next week, we are doing sex trafficking. And the themes are woven in into a very com complex script, kind of like a movie. So it's not hitting the players on the head, because even though it's a game, um, we really want to get people thinking about these ideas. Um, and we also have partnered with the International Sites of Conscience. Um, they are museums across the country, and those are other ways to get really on the ground, um, in-depth conversations about what's going on in real life and how far we, we are, how not so far we are, excuse me, from 2049 with things that are really going on in our country. Um, because it's a very dark and dystopic environment in this game, and we're not so far from that. Um, so, as I said, the game is very complex in terms of how you find your clues. We have a search engine from the future called Zuglio. Um, there's like five different microsites. So, it's a great way to get gamers involved. Again, like Iced, um, a lot of these gamers came on board um, weeks in advance because we basically put out a trailer, which I'll show you before I end, um, and we didn't say that we were behind it. We didn't say that Breakthrough Human Rights Organization was behind this crazy whatever. They didn't know if it was a movie. They didn't know what it was. It went up on YouTube. Um, Wired posted on it. A fast Company posted on it. Um, we were on the gaming section of YouTube. We have like 50,000 views in two weeks because they just didn't know. And we figured if we said a human rights organization is putting out a game, then that's just not going to fly nearly as well as this crazy project with the guy from Lost. So these are just some screenshots from the game. There's also a curriculum to go with it. We shot this curriculum. That's the furniture from our office. Um, and uh, you know, it's kind of like a tongue-in-cheek, uh, like the Today Show or Good Morning America. And it talks about um, the different themes in each week in the gameplay. Um, so you can access this at gooddayeveryday.com. So you can use it with the game or without the game. 
And these are just some um, tweets that I captured that I thought were really cool. Um, forget Farmville, Zynga, and Mafia Wars. Defend human rights and change the future with this new Facebook game. A new Facebook game moves beyond Farmville into promoting tolerance. Would you play this? Um, so we've just been capturing tons of just crazy tweets from people that are just really impressed that you know Facebook can actually be used to do something that engages you and gets people talking and thinking and building bridges. And I just want to show you the trailer that we put out, not saying that we were in it, and it was really hard because for months we could not say that we were involved in this at all. I think that's such an important lesson for people is that sometimes you have to be willing to hide your brand in order to reach people where they are and not sound like you're some outsider who's preaching to them. Um, our next uh, presenter is, oh, well, you have your, oh, you're queuing up the, okay, great. It's Eric Martin. He is one of the folks running uh, reddit.com, which is one of the biggest sites on the internet. Yeah, I know, it's like really freaking huge. And um, it is <laughs> the fact that, and so given the size of the community of people who are really engaged in it, uh, it really should come as no surprise that there's been a lot of interesting moments of activism that have come naturally through that. And he's gonna talk about how that's happened and how people who are not already part of the Reddit community can think about engaging with it, with this really powerful website and, it's, and the people who are involved on it. Um, Hi, it uh, so. Uh, I'm the community manager at Reddit. Um, yeah, and just want to talk to you a little bit about the Reddit community and some of the projects that people have come up with. Um, all of these projects that I'm going to show you, these are things that the you know seven or eight of us working at Reddit would have never sat down in a room and said, "Hey, this is something we should do." These are all things that the community, our audience, um, came up with, and then we helped support it. But um, we never would have come up with this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so uh, we did a we did a crowdsourced interview with uh, Barney Frank about a year ago, and one of the questions he had a, a really interesting response to, it was about one of the, um, uh, I, I don't know, one of the, one of the rallies on the mall, and, and he said, you know, if you're, if you're having fun doing something, it's probably not that effective. <laughs> and, and I think he has a good point, because I mean, his point was, if you're having fun doing it, you're probably not reaching people who disagree with you. You're just preaching to the choir. And, and I, I think that's true, but I also think with a lot of these projects we're talking about here today, you're, you're reaching people with a story. You're reaching people that, that don't agree or disagree with you. They have no idea what you're, they've never heard or never been involved in what you're talking about. So I think you can reach people having fun with story, with projects, with organic things like this, with some of the pop culture things that we've seen today. Um, yeah, so this is, a, this is a little swamp monster and the alien is fighting it. Uh, one of the many uh, devotional artworks our users have done. So if we go to the next slide. Um, the so, alien is the logo of, of Reddit. I'm sorry, yes, the alien yeah. is the... Uh, what? Slideshow? Oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, Reddit started in 2005. Um, this past month, we hit 1.1 billion page views. That makes us one of the top 100 sites uh, on the internet internationally. Reddit.com. Okay, so, R E D D I T. Yeah, any Redditors in the room? Yay. Oh, yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we've grown really fast. We've gotten really big. Uh, we do about 16 million unique, 15 million unique views uh, a month. Um, and people spend an average of like 15, 16 minutes on the site, which is really high. Um, so we go to the next one. Um, so this is, this is just kind of a 
shows you what Reddit looks like. It's, it's called a social news site. Um, people can submit stories, be they links, pictures, videos. Um, they vote them up or down. Things rise and fall from the homepage. Uh, people also comment on them. Again, you can vote up and down comments. Those rise and fall based on how many votes they've gotten. And the, the big difference between Reddit and some of the other things out there um, in, in this space is that a third of the content on Reddit are what's called self-posts. So a third, of the, a third of the links on Reddit aren't actually going anywhere, it's just text. So it could be a rant, it could be a question about uh, my washing machine broke, it could be, you know, I'm in, I'm in uh, Boston for the weekend, what should I do? It could be a, a, you know, a crazy scheme to, to do something, like uh, start a political action committee, so, uh, which we'll hear about later. Um, so a third of the content on there is actually not linking off, plus you have all the comments. And, and it becomes, you know, it, to me it feels like the message boards that I grew up with you know, in the, in the mid and late 90s, uh, you know, in addition to linking out to other places. Um, so one of the first big projects, and this was uh, like 2006, uh, Greenpeace had a, was trying to, uh, you know, uh, rein in the Japanese government hunting uh, humpback whales, and they had a project to name one of the whales. Um, all of the names that Greenpeace uh, suggested were very, you know, majestic, and it was like Ashanti, and the Persian word for harmony. <laughs> and all this kind of stuff, and kind of as a, as a throwaway, they accepted one user submission that was Mr. Splashy Pants. Um, the internet found out about this, and this wasn't just Reddit, this was you know, Reddit, Dig, 4chan, Boing Boing, all these sites found out about it and said like, okay, we have to name the whale Mr. Splashy Pants. <laughs> So, um, you know, Mr. Splashy Pants became one of the top names. Uh, Greenpeace initially came out and said, you know, this is just not dignified. This is a humpback whale. This is the <laughs> largest mammal on the planet. We can't name it something that a four-year-old would come up with. <laughs> and uh, so they redid, they opened up the voting for another week, and they said, like, come on, guys, let's be serious. And Mr. Splashy Pants won by even more. <laughs> And people started doing, people started Facebook groups, they started, uh, uh, you know, like cafe press stores to sell shirts and merchandise. And eventually, you know, the Greenpeace came out and said, you know what, like, this has gotten so many people who normally wouldn't care about humpback whales interested in this. You know what, we were wrong, this is really great. And they embraced it and they started, you know, selling merch and including it. And uh, yeah, the Japanese government stopped the hunting of the humpback whales in 2007. So. Hopefully, uh, Mr. Splashy Pants had something to do with that. Uh, but, li but like a lot of the stories, you know, they, it, again, like this is not something Greenpeace would have thought of when they were in their room planning this campaign. It's something that happened, and you have to respond to it quickly, and you have to embrace it, and you have to kind of stoke the fire a little bit, which is what happened here. Um, another thing that happened on Reddit, and again, this is one of these self-posts. Uh, so right after the uh, Glenn Beck rally, which I'm sure you all were at, um, <laughs> a Redditor woke up and said, you know, I have this vision and I just can't shake it. Colbert needs to hold a satirical rally in D.C. This blew up, got tons of attention on Reddit, a bunch of other sites. People started a website, ColbertRally.com. They did all kinds of things to, uh, you know, try to get people at Comedy Central to uh, pay attention to this. And then, you know, they decided, well, maybe, maybe they don't think we're serious. You know, we're just a bunch of internet people. Everyone thinks we just sit around in our basement and play video games. Let's show them that we're serious. Let's uh, donate money to Donors Choose which is a charity where Colbert's on the board. Let's you know, blackmail him with, with donations. So in, in like a week or two, we donated you know, half a million dollars. And that's, you know, and I, I, you know, the Comedy Central people will tell you, well, they had this idea a while back, but I mean, I think this showed everyone involved that you know, this was serious. People would take off work, people would drive to DC, people would rent hotel rooms, all that kind of stuff. So uh, you know, the rally ended up being a huge success, and this sort of organic movement on Reddit, I think, was a large part of that. Um, this is, uh, you know, so we, these crowdsourced interviews, which I mentioned, the Barney Frank one, um, we do on Reddit. This is a, a recent one that uh, uh, Anthony Weiner did, and just to show you kind of the sort of the um, reach that one of these crowdsourced interviews have, and we have these on on Reddit. It's a section called "I am a," so people say, "I am a, a high school teacher," "I am a NASA engineer," "I am a Democrat who fights." In this example, and so this got, um, you know. Uh, Two and a half thousand votes, uh, you know, uh, four and a half thousand comments. Um, there was a total of, you know, uh, sixty-two thousand people voting on the uh, on the post itself and the comments. That's a lot of people voting online. And then, you know, it had uh, one hundred fifty thousand page views with people spending, you know, three four minutes on the on the site. I'll, I mean, I'm sorry, on that post. So these posts wow. get a lot of attention. So if you have something going on. This is a really great audience that wants to ask you questions. It wants to, you know, hear your feedback, 
And the important thing in these, and I think something that uh, Representative Weiner did real well, is that you know people ask tough questions. They'll ask, they'll bring up things that maybe you don't want them to bring up. But as long as you respond, you know, kind of honestly, or say even honestly, I, I'm not going to answer that. Uh, as long as you do that, people are, are are pretty receptive by the fact that you're willing to come on and interact with the audience. Um, this was another project um, after Haiti. Uh, we partnered with a group called Direct Relief um, to raise money for Haiti, and we challenged uh, a bunch of other sites on the internet to see who could raise more money. Um, and a bunch of people joined in. Like, so this little comic here is by uh, Zach Weiner, who did, does a Saturday morning breakfast cereal. If any of you guys know that, yeah. and so he said, you know, he, he came on and, and said, I, you know, the internet's not going to donate that much money. They're a bunch of dickheads. Um, you know, prove me wrong. Raise a hundred thousand dollars. So he raised a hundred thousand dollars, and he did this little logo saying, you know, the internet is not hundred percent tickets. <laughs> um, and one of the one of the important lessons here is, you know, the direct relief guys. One of the reasons we partnered with them is they were very open about feedback. So they were willing to come on and do interviews. They were willing to actually, you'll see in a later slide, send us pictures of the pallets of medical supplies with Reddit stickers going to Haiti, getting loaded on the cargo planes. They were willing to answer any and all questions people had, whether they were, you know serious or, or crazy, or, you know, so that kind of feedback and also give us really detailed feedback about exactly what that money was going to. The same with Donors Choose. And we're dealing with the online audience. You're talking a lot about geeks, engineers, people that really get, you know, like spiritually annoyed by inefficiency and, and bureaucracy and, and, you know, the lack of transparency. So the reason these things work very well is because direct relief, Donors Choose, those give you r as much feedback as you could possibly want about what your money and your time is going towards. And that's why, you know, like recently with some of the NPR stuff, the, the geeks on, on Reddit got really frustrated because you, you, you have to donate to a general fund. You can't say exactly what your money is going towards. You don't know where it's going. And that really frustrates the, you know, the core passionate online users because they are, you know, engineers and believe in efficiency. So that's very important when you're, when you're trying to raise money um, or get volunteers online. Um, and again, this is just a, an example here. Feedback is key. Again, we have uh, direct relief actually putting Reddit stickers and taking photographs and uploading them to Reddit um, with the pallets going to Haiti. And here we have uh, uh, Donors Choose, one of the teachers that was uh, benefited from this fundraiser, had her kids draw um, you know, little Reddit alien superhero coloring things, um, which is also part of our long-term user acquisition strategy. <laughs> Get them young. Um, so this is a... If you're, if you're uh, on Reddit, this is Facebook Girl. She's a popular internet meme, and I think uh, this thing is important here. The truth is no one cares what you think. Um, so if you come on Reddit or any of the other you know, big online sites and just come out with your idea and why you think something's important, it's not going to work because no one cares. They don't. Um, the story, the reason people get involved is because they get involved with something that happens organically and something that's fun to tell their friends about and fun to talk about online. Not because of the cause, you know, which which has important, but the reason people get excited, the reason these projects get so much energy and attention, is because it's a cool story. Oh, a guy woke up at five in the morning and had the idea to do a Colbert rally, and it blew up online, and there all these things happened. That's a fun story to talk about. Reddit challenge dig to raise you know x amount of money for Haiti, and they you know they didn't reply for for a few weeks, and finally we go to them into doing it. That's a fun story. Um, so that's that's really important, and and you know again we could have never come up with these things on our own. They're things that happen in the community, and you recognize it, and then you try to support it as much you can. But it, the, all the good ideas come from the audience, not from the people up top. Um, and this I think is another really important thing. This is Courage Wolf, one of my favorite uh, advice animal memes, um, and he says, "Bite off more than you can chew, and then chew it." <laughs> and I think that's really important too. And that that, that goes, I mean. Someone biting off more they can chew, and then the uh, online community coming in to help them chew it mm -hmm. makes for a much more interesting story than someone who has everything planned out for the, from the beginning. And I, I think, you know, Eddie will tell you a little about uh, one example of that. So, you know, no one says, oh, I want to, you know, I, I think Colbert should have a rally, or I think we should raise, you know, uh, or another example, we had a World Backup Day, which uh, uh, a few weeks ago on Reddit, some of the people in the IT community said, you know, we should have a World Backup Day right before April Fool's, March 31st, and people should re, you know, look at how they back up their data. Um, and yeah, wh let's make that happen, right? They didn't have a plan, they didn't think it through, they just put the idea out there, other people joined on, and now, like, World Backup Day, we got coverage in, like, all the major IT blogs. There's a separate site, it got support from all these online backup and device backup places, and now it's gonna be, like, an annual event. 
But they didn't have a plan from the beginning. They just, they just said, let's do this, and they started. And that's how you get people to flock to your story online. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we'll have Eddie talk about an idea that came together on Reddit that really, really took off. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I just want to say I'm extremely flattered to be here with all these people who are doing amazing things like human rights and uh, administrator of one of the most, uh, the biggest sites in the world. And up until November, my biggest claim to fame was that I was in a Best Buy commercial. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, very exciting for me to be here. Um, all right, so what happened was I, I used Reddit to start uh, a 501c4 uh, political advocacy organization. It started with this story on a Sunday night. It says, GOP wins in Congress effectively doom net neutrality. And so I've seen, and we've all seen stories like this, a million stories like this, where the media tells us that it's hopeless for us. Like, it's already done, it's been... It's written, it's in the books, and so I was so frustrated, I went to Reddit, and uh, I apologize, there's gonna be some salty language. Um, and I said, I posted a link to the article, and I said, you know what, F this idea that we can't get anything done with the Republican Congress. If we want net neutrality or anything else, then we need to demand it. And I said, I propose a Reddit political action committee, not committed to a party or a politician, just good policy. And as you can see, it got 1,600 plus votes, and I did not want to start a political action committee. This was like a whim, I was annoyed. The first comment I made on this was like, I'll give 100 bucks if someone wants to do this. Uh, and then I realized no one was gonna do it. And so for whatever idiotic reason, I was like, all right, let's do this. And, uh, and so it went from there. And uh, one of the things you can do on Reddit is start a subreddit, which is so great. Like you just make a subject that you want to talk about. Like he talks about the IAMAs. Uh, I started a subreddit for for this, and you can see sort of the first. Uh, these are the first posts from you know the first uh, day of Reddit. And uh, if we scroll down, like these are the very first things we were talking about. People, we weren't sure what we were going to do. People talked about TSA campaign finance was brought up. Uh, you can see four ways to make our pack not suck, because that's what uh, we started call it started out as our uh, pack. And then uh, at some point, someone said, "Let's do an our pack Canada," which I was very uh, I was very flattered by, but I don't think our pack Canada has taken off just yet. Um, but to speak to Reddit's power is uh, that morning I got a call from the Daily Beast, and they wrote a story about this. Uh, a 26 year old Los Angeles comedian, blah 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 blah. Uh, side note, they wanted, they asked me if they could write 26-year-old unemployed Los Angeles comedian. <laughs> and I push back on that because uh, if you're an actor in Los Angeles, you are unemployed. Uh, that's just how it is. There's like six actors working and they just keep uh, shuffling <laughs> them through. Uh, and then, oh, so Gawker picked it up and uh, and so it was, it was great to get attention, but then uh, tech president says, uh, writes about it and says, consensus is in, our, in our office is that it's easy to start something on the internet and eas even easier to never finish it, which is so true because one of the problems with the internet is like, I could walk away and no one's gonna push me to keep it going. Uh, and so that's definitely a challenge, you know, because you know, everyone's anonymous and this is something Malcolm Gladwell talks about, is like you don't have these strong ties. So you're trying to figure out, you know, how to keep those ties and something I definitely struggle with uh, as the days go on, but we're still alive, so that's good. Um, and then Free Press saw us, and then we worked with them uh, to, deliver uh, to deliver petitions to the FCC this last December uh, when they uh, announced their less than great net neutrality rules. And uh, we actually had Tim Carr from Free Press do an IMAMA, and actually this is, th these are so great, because this is an incredibly informative discussion about net neutrality that's huge, and I've gone back to this a number of times. Uh, and again, it's a great way to interact, and you can find so much great and also just extremely in interesting information uh, on uh, if you go to Reddit and you go to that IMAMA page. There's just so much interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, I delivered pictures. This is a horrible screenshot of me. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll talk later. Uh, and then, you know, so six weeks after I make a post on Reddit, I have a discussion with uh, Commissioner uh, Minyoung Clyburn about uh, net neutrality and why wireless, the wireless protections aren't good enough, which God knows why I was doing that. But it was great. <laughs> and uh, I, 
It was, I mean, and it was completely true. And then uh, Mashable actually cared what we had to say when we said we weren't happy with the net neutrality rules. And, uh, and so I, I think like working with Reddit is like figuring out what these people you know, care about and what they think, and you have to follow what they want. And this is today's politics page. And you can see uh, the, US, the, the number one story is a self-post that says the US budget is like a first player playing Oregon Trail. Spend all the money on ammunition so you can shoot at stuff, then wonder why your wagon is falling apart and everyone is dying of dysentery. <laughs> So, you like this is the attitude of the uh, most of the political people on Reddit, and this this post has been seen today by tens of thousands of people, uh, which is an amazing thing. Uh, you know, he talks about it. You can just post yourself, and this is being seen by so many people. This I think Reddit is the most open media outlet than s that someone can access. Granted, you have to have an incredible amount of luck good fortune to hit the front page, but uh, I think it's an amazing and exciting thing. And that's why when we try and take an action, I mentioned that I lose sleep over upvotes because we don't have a huge mailing list just yet, so when we were doing our first actions, we were hoping to get a lot of upvotes and that people would see it. Um, and so, and that's why the next thing, so the next thing we thought we would do, we wanted to do something interesting, uh, we decided to send Al Franken a bunch of Valentines for net neutrality to say, like, thank you for being such a great champion of net neutrality, as he has been. And I, I actually posted this a number of times, like one that was kind of angry, like, we're going to lose net neutrality. Let's send Al Franken some Valentines. No one voted for it. And, uh, you know, I just tried a bunch of different wording, and then finally this one worked. And as you can see, it got 2,000-plus uh, votes. And then we actually, we went, uh, people put into a form on our website to make these Valentines. And then what we did is we printed out the form and I went to DC. We actually cut them out, uh, you know, these 2,000 or so Valentines. And we went and we met with Al Franken's office and Kay Bailey Hutchinson's office. And, uh, and then of course we, you know, posted about how awesome we were. And, uh, uh, which is what you gotta do, you gotta promote yourself. And, um, and then because we had developed, you know, a little bit of a rapport with Al Franken, we got uh, their office to agree to, for Al Franken to take questions from us. And so I put up this Ask Senator Al Franken Anything on the IMAMA, and it was kind of this vicarious thing because Franken didn't have enough time to actually go on the site and answer all these questions like Wiener did, which I think is actually a more fun and lively way to do it. But we, we took what we could get. And then... So this is sort of the interesting thing about Reddit is you don't have control. So I want to talk about net neutrality and, and Al Franken's championing, championing of this issue. And the top voted comment is, why did you vote to extend the provisions of the Patriot Act? So after this is the number one comment, and there were, there were so many, there's so much discussion of this and so much anger about this. I got an email from Franken's people saying, hey, we just want to talk about net neutrality. And if you see, notice these edits, these are me like backing up, I apologize, clarification, I'm being pummeled. And uh, you know, that is the Reddit community. They want what they want. And uh, you only have so much control uh, over what you're gonna get. But Franken did answer the questions that were sent, and he actually did answer the, uh, the Patriot Act question. And something I was really proud of, which was, uh, this is the first place I saw that I could find that Al Franken actually responded to his vote on the Patriot Act. So uh, that's really exciting to me. Al, the first place Al Franken talked about this was on Reddit uh, in response to our questions. And we actually posted this, these answers, the day after Anthony Weiner had come on Reddit. And Business Insider did a story on it um, that Anthony Weiner, you know, blah, 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 has come on to take questions on Reddit. And so I emailed them, I emailed Business Insider to let them know that we, a day before we had done it, and so then they wrote this headline, here's why Reddit could be a player in the 2012 election. My only, my only problem with this article is that my picture's not big enough. Uh, <laughs> if they could have made that the whole page or maybe make the article as just a comment on my picture, that might have been better. Um, but I think this speaks to Reddit's, Reddit's power, um, as a, like I said, as a media outlet. Um, the last thing I said 
in an email to them is I want to convince Redditors of the power they can wield if they act collectively. Because they control a front page of a website that gets, well, I guess now 15 million unique visitors a month. And if that's not a powerful tool to propel a grassroots, grassroots movement, I don't know what is. Um, so yeah, that's my crazy story of starting a 501c4 on the pages of Reddit. And here I am. It is now the Open Source Democracy Foundation, or OSDF, or if you have even less time, the OSDF. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I'm going to turn it over to questions, but I do want to really quickly go over some of the takeaway points I want to make sure people have a chance to hear. One is that you must respect the community that you're entering and realize that you can't control it all. You will lose control, but that's often how you will succeed the best. Um, you have to go to where people already are. These, you know, Reddit and um, and Harry Potter lines, they didn't go and like create their own YouTube. They didn't create their own Facebook. They didn't create their own Reddit. They went to Reddit. They went to Facebook. They were part of those communities. They went to the places that already had the audiences. Um, you need to do follow-ups to let people know what happened during whatever it is you've done and that people will get involved in your issue beyond the usual suspects when you meet them where they are. So let me turn to questions. <laughs> let me turn to questions. Um, First of all, since I'm older than all of you on the panel, uh, particularly in this session, I just want to make a brief comment, and I do have a question. Okay. okay. Uh, you give me hope. I've seen a lot of the world, okay, uh, from politics in New York City when I was a younger man to Vietnam, mm. and, and um, not only in this conference, particularly all of you, give me hope that the youth will take back uh, our democracy and take back the world. So I want to thank you. Aww. Okay. Um, uh, and um, this net neutrality, uh, I wondered if you could comment. As I'm getting an education on a whole world that's out there that you youth have all created, with net neutrality, uh, I believe the corporate structure in the short term is probably going to win. And as they do, what impact if we if we don't have net neutrality? Uh, let's let's take a worst case scenario. What impact would it have on the type of things that you're achieving that you share with us today? Anyone want to take that? Uh, I it would be uh, pretty if they implemented like this worst case scenario where an ISP offers you a hundred or two hundred sites for a set amount of price, which is the worst thing I could imagine. It would be pretty uh, devastating to not be able to organize online. I mean, to me, I think of the internet is like the salvation of being able to solve these problems because it's the one uh, medium that we all have and can all connect to easily. And so, if we lost it, uh, that's you know, it's a scary thought, and that's why we're fighting this. And it's also why net neutrality is uh, why we pick net neutrality. It's a great issue because the medium that's going to carry our message, these websites, these blogs, they all care so much about this issue. Uh, so um, that's why we're fighting this uh, so hard. And I, I certainly hope it does not get that drastically bad that soon. And uh, I don't think it will get that bad, but we got to keep pushing for it. I mean, one of the one of the only reasons the U.S. economy isn't even worse than it is right now is because uh, you know we're leading the way in innovation. And if the net neutrality thing comes out, that will kill all the innovation coming out of Boston, Silicon Valley, New York, college dorm rooms. There's things move so fast online, um, you know, and 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 there's new ways to communicate and share data and use open API sets and all these kind of you know new things coming out that any sort of regulation uh, is just going to kill it and it's and you know people are all that innovation is going to end up happening somewhere else or it's going to end up happening on you know uh, places on the internet that won't be as accessible to everyone because they'll be through you know all kinds of crazy you know back channels so uh, you know I think it would have a serious impact on the economy. I mean, we, we, well, for example, there's no way we could afford to have as, I mean, we, we can barely afford to keep the site up as it is, um, as some of you may know who've experienced our downtime lately. Um, if we were being throttled because of our bandwidth, we would get killed. There's just no way it can, we can support it through the kind of, I mean, you know, the, the, I mean, we have a team of seven people, 
and you know we're owned by a large media company, but there's no way we could do what we're doing without a lot of the the tools that you know the corporate uh, structure taking over net neutrality would would enforce. Uh, one of my best friends came up with the term crisisunity, which is uh, it's when there's a crisis. It's also an opportunity. It's not a crisisunity I'd want to uh, deal with uh, because I don't know what the ramifications of of taking down internet freedom would be. Uh, we've already seen the ramifications with taking down radio and TV. Um, so, but at this point. We've grown accustomed, I mean, to, to using it all the time. That um, hopefully it would be a crisisunity to bring people together, every single lover of internet freedom together in a way that hasn't happened yet, because so far it's all been we've been talking about. Oh, this could be bad, but this would be like uh, th there's the phrase at the uh, towards the end of Independence Day when Bill Pullman, as the president, says, "We will not go quietly into the night," yeah. or whatever. Uh, that we will not go quietly into the night, and this is going to be like take the rage and put it into the streets, but put it into the net in a way that they haven't seen yet, and it's going to make noise, and it's going to make them afraid, and we're going to damage them, uh, and it's going to be aggressive in a way that the Harry Potter lines has never been aggressive in that way. I would just really quick observe that there's a reason why so many of these groups have done stuff on um, net neutrality, and that's because people who are on the internet are very easy to get them to understand these sort of technology and access issues. So to think of thinking about how you can connect what your issue and causes with openness and um, dealing with people's ability to go around corporations and technology use is, I think, useful ways to talk to those audiences. Sifri. Thanks. Thanks. I came late, but I caught some really good stuff. Um, my question for on this uh, fight over you know freedom, democracy, and the internet is: Do you guys think it's um, good to connect those issues to the sort of anti-empire, you know, all the other left issues that lots of people here bring up, um, or it's better to somehow do these things separately? That's, th it's interesting you ask that because that's something we thought a lot about as we were starting this. And we all thought that st taking the first issue as a nonpartisan issue, because I that's really what net neutrality is. We're talking about, you know, just keeping the internet free because that way we can keep this broader coalition. And it does, like, obviously it, it, uh, it narrows the people who are going to follow you if you're talking about, you know, wars, uh, stopping wars. You know, if the first thing that we came out with was let's stop the war in Afghanistan, this would have never gotten off the ground. Though I do, I will say, I mean, I, I think this is, you know, like I said, the using the Internet is the model for those issues. Uh, maybe not necessarily for us, but I, I don't I don't see another way to get to connect everyone who cares as much as, you know, using the internet, whether it's through Reddit or, you know, through other, some other means. Yeah, I, that's a really provocative question, and I have a really provocative answer. Uh, first of all, E.J. Dion said um, that the, uh, in It's a Wonderful Life, Mr. Potter, ironically, the, the bad guy, uh, is trying to take over the whole town. That is the conservative model of pro-business. Now, the liberal model of pro-business is George, who has his independent store and is trying to keep that. Right, so when people say that we're anti-business by being pro-net neutrality, that's just incorrect. We're just anti-Mr. Potter in, a, in four or five companies taking over the entire freaking country. Okay, so every single business should be on our side. And, and my provocative answer is that when we have, when we turn this, I'm gonna lose some friends right now, but when we turn this movement into, first of all, as we say in media uh, reform activism, whatever your number one issue is, keep it. But make media reform your number two issue because your number one issue ain't going anywhere without media reform. Now, the thing is, a lot of people here are passionate about a lot of issues. One of them is anti-war stuff, great. 
but don't boo Speaker Pelosi when she's up there because it's making us all look like idiots. It's making us feel less respected. And when the MC gets up and says, stop all war right now, and doesn't mention our troops, doesn't mention that we just went into Libya to protect civilians, whether you agree or disagree, it makes us masturbatory creatures. And frankly, I spent too much of the first 22 years of my life masturbating. We need to have sex, okay? <laughs> we need to engage with this country in a way that we are not in an echo chamber, unless we want to lose. And the left has been losing for too long. Okay, this is not a leftist issue. Your number one issue may be leftist. This is an issue that is pro-business, that is pro-democracy, and that is pro every single freaking American, including the CEO of AT&T, if he cares about his democracy for his grandchildren. So we need to invite every single person and not boo the speaker and not say these insulting things to other people to alienate them. So excuse me for my provocative comment. I see a, I see a question in the back, and then we'll get to you next in the stack. Charles, or if you want to... Um, I know that, that some of you are in touch with the, the important organizations that specialize in online advocacy. I'm thinking Move On or, or Free Press or whatever. And you're talking about professionals who understand Washington, who manage lists properly. And I worry that you're stealing attention from those important people. And that ultimately, the attention you steal will be followed by dollars, will be followed by influence. And then what's going to happen to that industry of people that send out emails to get stuff to happen to Washington, D.C. It feels like you're toying with something very dangerous here, and I wonder what that's going to look like in a year or two. Wow. Anyone? We've sort of spoken ironically, as I should, ex disclaimer, that was sort of a, an opposite question. Yes. Um... I mean, good. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the beauty of, of the Internet is, uh, you know, ideally that the, the cream rises to the top. And so, you know, what, again, if we're, if we're just talking about what's important to us and not what's important to the story and what's important to the people who don't, aren't normally involved, then, then we've missed it. And you're not going to reach as many people. Um, and, you know, the, the um, you know, Reddit, we don't have an email list. We don't even collect emails. We, you know, show me another a site that gets a billion, a billion page views that doesn't, we don't have an email list, there's no link to our Twitter, there's no link to our Facebook. You know, people come back because of those things, uh, not in spite of them. And so I think that that's true also for some of these, you know, for some of these political movements is that, um, you know, it, it's, I don't know, I, I, I don't see, uh, there's definitely people who are very um, supportive of those groups in, in Reddit and some of the other similar spaces online, but not as many as you would think, even though they care about some of the same issues. So I don't necessarily think it's, it's, they overlap that much, but where they do, I, you know, whatever, the, the, better, the better stuff will win out. And you know, the, the, um, usually the, the things that win out are less kind of self-aware than some of that stuff tends to be, and that's, I think that's a good thing. Less self-aware and more organic, basically. Yeah. We had a question over here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. um, Political analysts tend to break up the American population into, what, six or 12 different demographics. And I wonder if you guys have done, tried to do any analysis, figure out which demographics you guys are actually reaching and which ones are getting left out. I mean, just for our organization, we're kind of interesting because we are also based in India, so we have a large South Asian um, organiz excuse me, audience. But we also, when ICED came out, you know, we worked with high school students to make a video game. Um, and actually, people in their 40s and 50s were playing ICED, um, in addition to um, high school students. So and it'll be interesting in looking at Facebook, um, you know, because Facebook started as you know, a college site, and now those people are older. Um, so I think people also that are playing games are much older and people um, that are taking action are, I mean, it's both. So in, in games, it's kind of an interesting, uh, that it's, it's skewing, games skew much older than it's, you know, you'd think, so. Anybody wanna? I mean, I would also just say that I think a lot of the audiences who folks in these groups are reaching are audiences who aren't getting reached by other forms of activism and a lot of the audiences who we're not reaching are ones who are being reached by those older forms of activism anyway. Um, and you had the next question, yeah. Um, you mentioned spirituality 
Um, every one of you said something spiritual or passion, passionate. I mean, because I think that's really, that's something that the older audience misses hmm. that, that is universal. Real fast, just to say the last question. Um, our director of operations is one of the only full-time employees for the Harry Potter lines. Heard about us, and the first time she heard about us on a Harry Potter site, she hated us. She thought we were stupid, we were angry. Activists are angry, they're bad. Now she's a full-time activist, so it turns around. Uh, we, we, we won her over somehow, um, but it's been a lot of people. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the going to give a very short answer to a very long question, but uh, any, anyone who's ever done any kind of body energy, healing work, acupuncture type stuff, the acupuncturist works on like an intuitive energy uh, field around you, and uh, there's all these uh, blocks that are happening, blocking the chi, if you want to, now I'm totally isolating myself into a sort of weird <laughs> new age corner here, but... Um, but there's a flow of energy, right, that goes through our body. And if it's blocked, we end up experiencing different physical and emotional and psychological problems. The acupuncturist's job is to uh, transmute or remove those blocks. Um, the thing is, is that if you look at two people who are married, let's say a man and a woman, uh, and they, uh, they go to a therapist for couples counseling, they refer to their marriage as a third entity, which I believe it is. And I believe that that marriage has a body and there are blocks in that body. If you go into a neighborhood, that neighborhood has a body and there are blocks in that body. And if you look at the earth, that our whole human race has a body. We're all exchanging molecules right now anyway. So can we treat the whole society, the whole culture as one organism and see where the blocks are and how to move those energy, that energy around? That's actually not necessarily spiritual, but it is if you want it to be. I, I want it to be, so I choose to look at it that way. I just remember that you said to me yesterday that where's the cultural energy? It's a Harry Potter and it's in music fandoms and it's in movie fandoms. So it's about taking the energy that's in those fan activities that we identify so much with personally and also translating that to the areas that need help, like human rights issues and stuff like that. Um, did you? Uh... Uh, I wasn't going to comment on that until this gentleman over here mentioned about spirituality, you know. I happen to practice Buddhism, so I, I find myself many times uncomfortably bringing up the uh, subject of spir spirituality because even today in, in uh, you know, the so-called Aquarian age, um, there's an uncomfort with talking about spirituality. But mm -hmm. I think um, it's important for me, once I become more uh, acquainted with the technologies that you young folks um, <laughs> are so facile with, uh, I'm trying to uh, become more facile with it, but um, the point I'm trying to make is that um, probably I should be, you know, uh, on the internet talking about spiritual issues as well as activism, as well as the arts, because um, I really find that now is a really crucial time. It's push come to shove time, and uh, in terms of the the this planet, and uh, if we avoid the uh, issue of spirituality in any struggle then I think we are missing the point because I think it's wisdom and compassion that are going to win the day. And however anybody can find out how to develop wisdom and compassion and fortune and courage, and then all the activism in the world I don't think is going to change things uh, just by its in and of itself. Thank you. Um, I so I mean, I, I, I just want to kind of bring the perspective of, of definitely, you know, the Reddit audience, and I think a lot of the internet audiences, is, is most of them are full-blown, pocket-caring atheists. And most of them believe that acupuncture and all the New Age stuff is just, it's, it's you know, mumbo-jumbo, and there's no proof for it. So, I mean, this is a, another reason why I think it's important to keep, you know, issues like net neutrality and, and or, you know, take your pick, separate from all some of the other stuff. Um, because the uh, you know the online audience again the people who are really hardcore into the stuff are engineers they're geeks they believe in science they believe in reason and anything that doesn't have a bunch of double blind studies proving it uh, is not going to be is not going to be accepted so just keep that in mind the the on you know the you know kind of fuzzy fuzzy words and uh, you know are not um, are not going to be very persuasive with the online crowd. That's with the Reddit crowd. And that's important to recognize that. Um, the Harry Potter Alliance, the weapon we have is love, is our slogan. We use this language all the time. Um, so I'm going to disagree. That's not the online crowd. That's the Reddit online crowd. And there is a lot of that, there's a lot of that, and that's great to acknowledge that. It's very important. But that's not representative of the American people. And the fact that you're bringing up spirituality 
and you're presumably on the left, is probably very good for us that you're doing that. So, yeah. And Joanna Macy. Take a look at Joanna Macy, everybody. I mean, so we can be both scientists yes. and spiritual. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, just the, there are multiple internet cultures, and that wherever you're going, whether it is Reddit or Daily Coast, you have to familiarize yourself with that culture, with the languages that those people use, and not presume that everybody's seeing things your way, but also you can work with them better if you... Uh, you know, take time to look and understand it. What he's saying is very true of Reddit and a lot of other sites I can think of, but every part of it is different. There isn't one internet community at all. Uh, can we take, uh, we, I swear, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, would you give us a minute on your Imagine Better and where you're headed with that? Oh, uh, yeah, we're gonna, um, actually you just gave me a whole idea about, um, with Reddit about uh, doing, um, uh, we're doing this campaign around Chocolate. We want to get beyond Harry Potter fan community, but that's where we're starting. And I, I really want Stephen Colbert to sign the petition, be not because he cares about child slaves, but because he cares about chocolate <laughs> 20 years from now, because he likes sweets. So we're going to start like a Stephen Saves Chocolate campaign. So I want to propose that on Reddit. Um, but we're, we, uh, we have a lot of interesting ideas around popular culture, around, um, uh, I keep bringing this up, um, Nicholas Kristoff, uh, but there's no way to just sort of frame this in a really quick way, but just an example. Uh, <laughs> I have to, right? You're going to kill me. Okay. Uh, we're going to come up with a uh, popular culture that is um, not... So, for instance, Avatar. When a movie like Avatar comes out, that's a tremendous opportunity to get involved in environmental activism and say we're going to protect the Pandora, uh, the real Pandora, and fight this, this, the sky people in the coal industry. Um, but we're going to be doing more than that uh, in, in, that, that includes creating popular culture, and I'll, I don't have time to talk about it, but I'd love to be engaged with you more about it. I mean, I know that a lot of what you guys are doing is you're bringing together different fan communities that are really dis disparate um, and fans of very different things to get them to all work on marriage equality and gay rights issues and stuff like that, right? That's yeah, part of... It's, it's, it's really important to recognize that every fan community has their own language. Every fan community has their own language. Oh, yeah. uh, that every fan... It's very important to recognize that every fan community has their own language and to recognize that language. Just such as Reddit and such as the Harry Potter fan community are pretty different um, for the most part. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions that folks had? I, are we on time? We've got like two more minutes, right? So we'll take that. Hi, I'm uh, Cindy Samuels. I'm from Care2. And I'm just interested, somebody asked generationally as a demographic target question. I'm interested in it as a how are you considering it question, and does it matter to, especially Reddit, which I, I know is very sort of young dude place, not as much as Dig, but uh, can you talk across here about the generational, how much you want to bring the generations across together, if you have any goals or thoughts about that? I mean, for our organization, I mean, I think it's important that it doesn't just stay online because everybody isn't online. Um, and just try to find the people that would be interested in things that are online, but meet them where they are, like in these museums, in communities, um, and have conversations with them. So I think that is a way that we get people that aren't online, they don't have it on their phone, um, kind of to build those bridges. Yeah, I would say usually, I mean, um, I think if you look at the, whatever, third-party research, we're somewhere in the mid-30s um, in terms of our average audience. I, I think a lot of Redditors would suspect that to be lower, and we're probably, you know, 70% male, um, and probably 70% uh, U.S. and 30% international, which is, um, I think, a, a good thing. Um, but, yeah, we we when we find, um, uh, you know, new people coming in, especially from, you know, n our non-traditional demographics, a lot of times they come in around a specific subject. So they get interested because there's a really great Reddit community for their favorite sports team, or there's a really great Reddit community for, um, you know, woodworking, or a really great Reddit community for the particular type of car they have, um, or there's a really great Reddit community for their local area. And th that's another thing I try to go whenever I travel. I try to go to local Reddit meetups. I mean, I know there's meetups for you know, you name it, and and you really see a nice mix of um, of all different kinds of people there. So the you know. Um, because I think in general, one, you know, the, the, uh, you know, our uh, traditional demographic um, uh, that you would think, you know, um, is less likely to come out to events like that. So I think when you actually go to uh, real life events, you, you see a, a better mix than is actually online just because the people have developed a little more social skills than maybe uh, the, the, the kids in their young 20s. Um, that's my theory. I don't know. 
Uh, yeah, that's something I think a lot about because uh, because we're from Reddit, where we are obviously skewed uh, younger and skewed male. But um, I I want for the OSDF to be uh, to be doing stuff in real life that you know connects us to uh, you know a wide swath of people and and different age groups. And I think there's definitely a place for uh, at least in my mind, for a political group to be doing uh, philanthropic things and, and reaching out more in the community and that you can be uh, someone who's political but also sort of expand what you do. And I think through that, you can reach different age groups and reach different types of people. Uh, yeah, there's room for every single person in this room to be part of the internet culture. I and mean, that's, it, it, it does not, you know, Frank Sinatra sang the song, Love Isn't Just for the Young, so... Um, neither is the internet. Um, so uh, th th we want to do, with Imagine Better, um, one of the things that I want to do around this expanding cultural acupuncture, playing on the energies, I'm going to try to talk really fast. Um, we're in Boston. Everybody knows Boston. Uh, Red Sox fans hate New York Yankees fans and vice versa. So we're going to play on that rivalry um, and say, okay, if you like... Uh, if you're in New York and you love the Yankees and you're in Boston and you love the Red Sox, prove it by proving that you love your city more. So we're gonna so we'll create a system, and I don't have the funding for this. So if anybody wants to help with that, tell me. Um, I'm sorry to sound like a beggar, but I am. That's my job. Um, uh, the we want to to log in community service hours, and your community service hours um, end up translating into points. And so let's say we, only, we don't get that many people to participate the first year. The minute that the New York Yankees fans win, it's gonna, the next year it'll be huge in Boston. And the minute that the Red Sox fans win, it'll be huge the next year in New York. So within five years, if we can get 0.5% of those fans to be doing community service in their cities, they're gonna get to know their cities, they're gonna get to know what's going on, and they're gonna be engaged in new ways. One of the themes I'm seeing is a competition between different groups is really a big driver for participation. Video games are competitive. I mean, I, some of yours are less and some of them are more, but, and, and these contests are competitive, and, and they're, but they're like good competition. They're not negative competition. They're constructive competition. You know, it's, it's interesting because I keep having this reaction to some of the audience questions and the interplay. There seem to be two themes, and one is how do we reach everybody? and get everybody involved. And the other one is how do we stay true to what feels passionate and real for us and tap into that energy. And I think the competition thing is a really creative idea. I think the competition between different internet communities is really interesting. And I'm wondering, it sounds like um, you're, I forgot your name, sorry. Christy, it sounds like there's a, um, that your organization uses the web as one format and then you have some other formats. And so I'm, interested if there's a couple other examples of places where you've had that dichotomy and you've come up with a strategy to say, how am I going to go outside my usual range or do I choose to stay true to a, a group culture? I mean, I think for an organization, I think we have to find, we create a project and we find what works best for each and we've decided that the web's not going to work best for everything. Um, we have to we have to go into communities. Um, we also when we create a video, we have it online, but we also make DVDs that we actually send people. Um, and then maybe you know when they do have access, they will find us online. But we have to try to find. We have many platforms to reach um, our various audiences. So. Yeah, one, one example on Reddit that uh, goes back to the, the spirituality thing is we actually had a competition between our atheist community and our Christianity community. Uh, and then the Muslim community got involved too. So, and they were all, I, I forget what they were raising money for, but it was something they all kind of uh, agreed upon. And they, you know, they challenged each other and tried to recruit other, other people. So even competitions within a community among people who disagree about, you know, s some um, very big things uh, can, can be an effective way to get everybody involved. everyone for participating and if anybody from here has any final thought that you haven't had a chance to say yet in terms of lessons that people should be learning or anything just uh, I'm passing the mic if anybody has any final thoughts I'll, I was just gonna say I'll plug our website which is the osdf.org uh, and you can sign up there for updates or become involved and and I want to say like we're still burgeoning and 
ideas that people have, we want to make, you know, happen and come to life. And, you know, if people have ideas to, you know, talk about bridging generations and bringing different people together, like, I would love to make that happen. And that can happen. It's just, you know, we have the idea and then we can put it together. P-H-E-O-S-D-F dot org. Thank you. I'll just say that uh, so Reddit and a lot of these other platforms and tools out there is open source. So steal, steal, you know, look at what we've done right and steal it. You know, <laughs> yeah. steal our threaded votable comments. I wish more of the internet had them, um, you know, so the best things will get voted up to the top. Steal some of the ideas about letting your community create sub-communities, um, both, both in a tech, tech uh, technology way and in a culture way, and I, th I think that's true a lot of these places. You you don't need to even be a programmer. Um, the stuff's out there. Steal it. Yeah. Uh, the thehpalliance.org. If you want to ask me questions, I'm Andrew at thehpalliance.org. At thehpalliance. So T H E is in book key, and I'm at Andrew Slack. Um, and if we lose this fight with net neutrality, we make it a temporary loss as part of a larger war, and we remember what happened in Egypt, and we, we unite, and we fight. Mm -hmm. So everybody play America 2049 to make sure that it does not happen in real life. Um, I have cards with um, the URL and all the information. It's www.america2049.com. And thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody.